So we have the pleasure to have uh, today Dave Charbonneau. Uh, so in things of math research, Dave really doesn't need any introduction. And he so doesn't need any introduction that I'm not quite sure I would know how to introduce him. But I'll start just saying that. So he actually did his master's thesis here uh, at University of Toronto and then moved on to Harvard for a PhD and then Caltech and then came back to Harvard and is now a professor of astronomy at Harvard and, and CFF. And uh, he's worked on uh, so many projects uh, trying to uh, image or uh, detect uh, extraterrestrial that it would be hard to, to count them, but always with the goal to try to characterize planets that could be or would be inhabited. And I guess he's going to talk about uh, one step getting closer to that, which is trying to understand terrestrial planets. So, okay. Welcome, Dave. Oh, thanks. Um, okay, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to come back, uh, and um, uh, let me give you actually, the, let me give you the kind of the background, the real background behind the story, which is I went on sabbatical last year. When you get the chance to go on sabbatical, go on sabbatical. I went to France. We lived in France, but I worked in Switzerland. And I was working at the Geneva Observatory. And for the seven years prior to that, we, Harvard had been collaborating with the Geneva Observatory to build a copy of a very special instrument. And that instrument was supposed to allow us to finally measure the relationship between mass and radius and presumably composition uh, and ultimately formation for the, for the terrestrial planets that we hope to find around other stars, okay? So it was a, it was a big goal. It was started uh, prior to the launch of Kepler. Um, while in Geneva, I got to think about that. Um, I'm, I also got promoted to lead the science team. I ran unopposed, but it's an also administrative role. Um, and that's what I'm telling you about today. So, so it's, it's unpublished. Uh, it's also an entirely new talk. This is not the colloquium I have been giving for any significant period of time. I wrote this talk about 10 days ago. Um, uh, but the uh, results are well vetted. They're mostly submitted for publication, but they're not yet publicly available. Um, and I think I'm being <laughs> recorded, so. Um, well, that's good. We should share. Okay, so what are the big questions? So the big questions we really want to get at uh, first of all, what, what are the rates of occurrence of small planets, particularly planets similar in size to the Earth? Okay, so how common are these small planets? Um, what are the likely compositions of these planets? That's the big one I want to tackle. In particular, is, is there a maximum mass for an Earth-like planet? Is there a minimum mass for a Neptune-like planet? And what does that mean for our understanding of planet formation? And then finally, what are the prospects for improving our knowledge in the next five years? So very important if you're a graduate student, postdoc, uh, junior faculty, think of that in terms of what you've got to get done in the next couple of years. I think there's some very big opportunities coming up. Um, before I dive in, I want to thank uh, some of my um, recent uh, graduate students uh, and postdocs. I'll be um, uh, using much of their work, presenting much of their work today and acknowledge uh, the critical funding that we receive uh, from the National Science Foundation in the US, NASA. Interestingly, this is the first year where the uh, majority of my funding is private because of the difficult uh, federal funding climate in the US. So the majority of my funding is actually now Packard Foundation, Templeton, and some other uh, agencies. Um, OK, so um, to, uh, to sort of put this in a very big context, I, this is one of, one of my favorite plots in astrophysics. If you, if you draw a uh, bubble uh, around the sun, around the solar system, and you find all the objects in that bubble, and, and you find all the ones where you can precisely measure the masses and radii, and you put them on a plot, um, then, then you can get a plot where the mass spans uh, seven orders of magnitude. And this really puts the solar system in context, right? So here's the sun, okay? There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, the Earth, and Venus. And, and you know you can give a wonderful hour-long talk uh, to undergraduates just, just talking about all the, the variety of rich um, physical processes across this landscape. Um, of course, today we're going to be entirely concerned with this rather uh, sketchy part of the plot down at the bottom. That's what I'm going to try to fill in. So um, why, why do we care about masses and radii? Well, if, if I had uh, spoken to you three or four years ago before we really knew about uh, small planets orbiting other stars, um, then I would have shown you this plot, and I would have said, well, gosh, you know, I think if we understand the equation of state of hydrogen and helium, 
then there should be a pretty clear relationship between the mass of a ball of hydrogen helium with the cosmic abundance ratio and its radius, okay? And so uh, if I um, draw that theoretical relationship, here I'm showing the radii of planets, 1, 5, 10 Earth radii, so Jupiter is 11 Earth radii, and, uh, uh, and then the mass is plotted logarithmically, okay? So Jupiter's 318 Earth masses. And, um, and, 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 and there's Saturn, and then there was this huge surprise where we had found a number of uh, planets close to their stars, so we could measure their radii and their masses. Uh, they were similar in mass to Jupiter, but much, much larger. And, uh, and there's a very interesting set of theories that worked out as to explain why these planets were puffy. But, but the focus now is to try to push down into um, the smaller planets uh, that certainly are present in the, in the solar system. So at low masses, what we're going to do is use our knowledge of the equation of state of rock and ice and other materials to make informed uh, um, uh, predictions about the actual compositions of planets when we can precisely measure their masses and radii. And then another part of the excitement that we all share in exoplanets, which I won't go into today, but is important in terms of understanding some of, some of the things we've measured, is simply that the, the, the architectural, the information about the architectures of planetary systems has, has developed enormously. We have a very rich understanding of the dynamical processes, the presence or absence of, of resonances when we can see multiple planets transiting the same star. Okay, so um, the Kepler mission had a revolutionary impact in exoplanet science. It is difficult to think of a scientist who's active in exoplanets worldwide who is not uh, engaged in some part of their time in, in, in data from the Kepler mission or in fallout from the Kepler mission. Okay, and what Kepler did is it simply opened up the door for us to really have a detailed understanding of the population uh, of uh, small planets around um, sun-like stars. So Kepler had a four-year nominal mission. Uh, it launched in March of 2009. It began gathering science data in May of 2009. And just after four years later, the second of the four uh, reaction wheels failed. And so Kepler was no longer able to point towards its one field that had been studying for four years uh, very precisely. And so it could no longer gather very precise photometry on the 150,000 stars that it had been surveying for those four years. So that's the Kepler data set. Kepler has been reborn, and I'll tell you about uh, that later um, in, the, in the talk. But this, is the, this was the data set that uh, had this revolutionary impact in terms of understanding the populations of planets. So working with my postdoctoral fellow, Francois Fressin at the time, Willy Torres is a, a Smithsonian scientist at the, at the Center for Astrophysics. Um, what we did is to uh, take the results from the Kepler mission and then account for the, um, the sensitivity, the fact that there obviously would be more difficult to find smaller planets, and, and correct for the geometric probability, the fact that planets that are smaller from their stars uh, have a smaller angular range over which they can transit. So we, we know that for every more distant planet we see, there's, there's a certain number that presumably are out there but just don't happen to have the right geometry and other effects, and we corrected for all that, and we measured the uh, mean number of planets per star as a function of their size, okay? Uh, these planets are relatively close to their stars. These have periods shorter than that, just, just shorter than that of uh, Mercury. Um, and, um, and what you can see is that uh, large planets, planets roughly the size of Jupiter in these, you know, warm orbits are relatively rare. But then as you decrease in uh, planetary radius, uh, there's this dramatic increase and the most common kind of planet in the galaxy, at least at these orbital periods, is a planet that doesn't exist in the solar system. So it's a very interesting result. It appears the most common kind of planet in the galaxy for uh, this range of periods is a planet between two and three uh, Earth radii. So obviously in the solar system we have Neptune and Uranus, which are just about four Earth radii, and we have the Earth, which is one Earth radius, okay? Yes, you're with me? Good, okay. So, um, uh, so, that, so to kind of takeaway numbers are that 16% of sun-like stars have an Earth-sized planet. That doesn't mean an Earth-like planet. Uh, these, these planets are much hotter than the Earth for sun-like stars. And 52% uh, of sun-like stars, so at least half of the stars, uh, have at least one planet within an 85-day orbital period. Um, so uh, as you know, most stars in the galaxy are not sun-like stars. They're a much lower mass, M dwarfs. And so if we look at uh, the dominant population of stars in the galaxy, which are M dwarfs, they're typically 20% uh, 
the radius of the sun, 20% the mass of the sun, and 1 1,000th the luminosity of the sun, uh, we can do the same study with the Kepler data. So Kepler, uh, of its 150,000 stars, only about 4,000 of the Kepler stars were these uh, low mass M dwarfs. But because the stars were small, we had enormous sensitivity for those 4,000 stars because now the same size planet going in front of a smaller star blocks proportionally much more of the light. So um, for most of the sun-like stars that Kepler studied, we couldn't see the small Earth-like planets. For all of the M dwarfs, we could. So what did we find out? So in the case of M dwarfs, I'm showing the same plot. The error bars are a little bit bigger because there were fewer stars in the sample. Uh, and here I'm showing again the number of planets per star as a function of radius. For the M dwarfs, there are essentially no gas giants at relatively short periods. Okay, so here I'm going out to com comparable orbital periods, about 50 days. There, there are a few uh, standout examples from uh, radial velocity surveys where there are early M dwarfs with, with some more massive planets. But, you know, to, if, uh, the picture to carry in your mind is essentially M dwarfs don't appear to make close in gas giants at all, okay? And then all of a sudden we see this enormous uptick uh, again at just shy of three Earth radii uh, and uh, planets that are about the size of the Earth are quite common. And for the end dwarfs, we can really push down to sub-Earth radii. We can see planets as small as half an Earth radius uh, in some cases. Okay. Um, the other exciting thing that M dwarfs afford is not just the ability to find Earth-sized planets, but Earth temperature planets. And so then if you're interested in the question of habitability, uh, we, can, we cannot do this really for the sun-like stars with Kepler. So, there have, so I, you know, there have been some studies trying to look at the Kepler data and make statements about the frequency of, of planets that are the same temperature and same size as the Earth. Kepler has not found a single such planet. Okay? So that was the reason why Kepler initially was extended from four to an eight-year mission, was to, was to push on the stars it was studying. That was really the big, I think, intellectual loss. When we didn't get those additional four years of data, we really are not going to measure that number directly. We can extrapolate uh, based on what we think the planet population is doing at the point, the slightly more massive and closer in planets that we can see. Um, but we don't measure it directly. In the case of MDORS, we can measure it directly. We can say, look, here are, and this is work done uh, with my uh, graduate student, Courtney Dressing. Um, she published a paper about a year ago quantifying the rate of occurrence of Earth-like planets around M dwarfs. Because M dwarfs are the dominant star in the galaxy, main sequence around the galaxy, then, then arguably this is the rate of occurrence of habitable planets in the galaxy. Okay. So um, uh, this is not that published work. This is now Courtney going through and um, doing a more sophisticated analysis, correcting for all the things that she had to make assumptions about before. In particular, before we had to take from the Kepler data, we had to take, they told us what they thought the sensitivity was as a function of the noise properties in the data. What Courtney has now done is written her own code to go and find the planets herself directly in the Kepler data for those 4,000 stars. So what she can then do is in, inject planets uh, uh, as a function of their orbital period and, and radius, measure the fraction that are recovered, and so directly quantify the recovery rate. She's also using the full uh, data set. Before we had to use about half the data. Now we have the full four years of data, which has become available um, subsequent to her initial paper. And, and then she can, uh, these are all the stars where there are planets that she detects. So this is their orbital period, and this is the stellar effective temperature. And then the green swath through here is uh, a, a theoretical calculation of the habitable zone. So a uh, planet plopped down in here that was roughly Earth size um, would have liquid water on its surface if there was water abundant in, in the planet. Um, this, uh, the width of this zone is, uh, you know, there's a, there's a rich set of papers that are coming out uh, uh, talking about exactly where the boundaries would lie for M dwarfs, which have to do with solving a radiative transfer and what you think the composition of the atmosphere is and whether it's tidally locked and so on. Um, that's, that's not really the focus here, but the point is there are planets that we do find even in this relatively conservatively defined habitable zone. And so um, what uh, Courtney calculates is that the mean number of planets per stellar habitable zone is 0.35. Okay, so roughly one in three M dwarfs has a planet that is the same size roughly and same temperature as the Earth. And the size range is really quite narrow. You'll see statements about habitability where, where people are saying, well, planets 
smaller than two and a half Earth radii might be habitable, or planets that get four times the radiation that the Earth receives in the planet are habitable. That's, that's all nonsense, right? I mean, you know, you have to, you have, to have a rocky surface. We're, we're talking about an ocean that's a very small constituent of the planet's atmosphere. It can't, can't be a water planet. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, we're really at the edge of the habitable zone here on Earth. You push us a little bit closer to the sun, we don't make it to five billion years because of runaway greenhouse effects. So, okay. So, so uh, we wish we had more. We wish we had more, and there, there are other projects I won't talk about today that should fill that in. But, but it does look like we live, the, the universe we live in is, is relatively well populated with uh, planets that seem to have the correct bulk properties. Okay. She, the, she recovered uh, all but six of the 110 planets. Uh, when she didn't recover them, of course, that was very informative to us. And then she found a couple more planets that were not uh, found by the Kepler pipeline, but they are not habitable, but they are other planets in, this, in the search space. So, she, so, it, so the impact was not to change the planets, but it was really to quantify as a function of period and radius the sensitivity. And she now did that, so the point is for every, she did that for every single star. So instead of saying, um, we need a cylinder noise of seven across all, she can actually, on a star by star, because the stars show different variability, actually has a, has a sensitivity map. So it's really quite powerful. Yeah? It kind of looks like there are a couple bands of temperature, like 3,600 and 3,900, you covered it up now. Am I just hallucinating that or something? No, that is, no that, that's correct. So the way we get temperature is for many of the stars, we only have broadband photometry, which was the Kepler input catalog. And then we're fitting um, models, basically the Dartmouth stellar models, uh, to try to derive the temperature, uh, surface gravity, and metallicity of the star with these broadband photometric points. So they, they, it's not surprising they do kind of cluster uh, where, the, where you have the model grid points. Subsequent to this, making this plot, we actually have um, spectroscopy for many of these. And that, in that case, you really get the temperature directly. So. Um, okay, so, um, so the big plot I want to talk to in the, over the next kind of 15 minutes is this. This is the mass radius diagram. There are no data on this plot yet except for the solar system. Uh, but this is the plot that I thought, gosh, when I took over that science team for this instrument I'll tell you about, we need to stop. You know, you have this big science team. Everybody's got something they want to go after, some little pet question. But we had to uh, kill all of those ideas and do one really big thing together, okay? So what, that's what we're trying to do. This was the reason we created this instrument, which is to really measure the mass radius relation for planets smaller than two and a half Earth radii. So, so you know, we're zoomed way in, okay? So ne Neptune, Neptune would be like here on this plot, and Uranus, okay? And, and uh, what are we on the 13th floor? So then Jupiter would be like, uh, you know, on the roof or something, okay? So just to put this in context, <clears throat> Here, then, I'm saying for, if I, if I have a sphere of fixed composition, like magnesium silicate, okay, the, the principal component of the, kind of the mantle of the Earth, uh, this would be the relationship between uh, mass and radius. Uh, if we had a pure iron body, this would be the relationship. Obviously, the Earth and Venus are a mixture of iron and magnesium silicate. And then if I start adding volatiles and fluffy things like water, the planet pops up very quickly. And then just like a whisper of hydrogen and it's a very, very puffy planet because hydrogen, particularly for close-in planets, uh, really um, increases the radius, even though you don't change the mass very much. Okay, the, the grayed out region is where we don't expect to find planets. And that was a calculation done by Robert Marcus, who was a graduate student at the time at Harvard. And what he was considering was the following. Well, if you, in the protoplanetary nebula, silicates and iron condense at roughly the same temperature. So uh, close to the star, meaning within the ice line, you should have a uh, uniform, you should have a ratio, which is just set by whatever the protoplanetary disk gives you, of uh, the solids will be some fixed ratio of iron and magnesium silicate, and that doesn't vary tremendously from one star to the next. So um, when you make a ball of rock and iron, then it differentiates, the iron sinks to the core, but uh, you should have some fixed abundance ratio. And the only way to get um, more iron-rich, denser planets is then after it differentiates to have catastrophic impacts that knock off the mantle, the outer part, the lighter part of the planet is now magnesium silicates. So if you have impacts that can blow that off, then you're increasing the, the relative iron content of the planet. He considered the most energetic single impacts 
and uh, said, well, this is the best you could do. And it's a mass dependent function. When you have a more massive planet, then it's much harder to change the ratio, okay, because you have to have a really devastating impact to remove a lot of the mantle. So this is kind of a rough, we wouldn't expect to find like pure iron planets, is what I'm saying. Um, okay. So, so let me try to fill this in. So there, there are various ways to measure masses for planets. One way, which seems too good to be true, is uh, to get it for free from the photometry. So um, there, Kepler has given us uh, stars where there are multiple planets transiting the same star. And then if we can actually see, in some cases the planets don't arrive like clockwork, but the transits occur uh, a little bit early or a little bit late, and that's due to the gravitational influence of other planets in the system. And if you can see those timing variations for all of the planets that transit, uh, then you can uh, calculate the masses relative to the star, and if you make an informed estimate of the mass of the star, you can solve the system. You can get the masses of the planets with no, with nothing, with no spectroscopy. Okay? So that's, that's great. And I want to show you kind of one of the best such examples, which is Kepler-36. So Kepler-36 was previously some, you know, run-of-the-mill star in the Kepler field. This is a typical Kepler data set. Um, you can see here it's spanning, so 800 days, 900 days. And you can see these dropouts. Those are transits uh, of, of one planet. And when we phase up those deep transits, we get this guy. So this is, uh, this is the bigger planet in the system. But then uh, if you do a search which your eye can't pick out, there's another planet in the system which is smaller. Okay, so the phase transit is much shallower. Okay, the, um, uh, the interesting thing about these planets is that they have very similar orbital periods and therefore very similar insulation, receiving the same similar amounts of energy from the central star. Okay, so uh, their orbital periods are 13.8 and 16.2 days. They're very, clo they're very close to the six to seven uh, ratio. The other, the other key component of the system was that the photometry was so good that you could measure the astroseismic modes of the star. So you could actually see the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the standing, the, 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 um, the acoustic waves uh, in the star that then allow us to determine not just the mean density, but because the data were very good, the density as a function of stellar radius. So uh, what that allows us to do is uh, constrain not only the mass and the radius of the star, but the age of the star. As the stars age, they convert hydrogen to helium, they become more centrally concentrated. So um, the exquisite knowledge of the radius helps us because here we're measuring the radii relative to the star. Now we get a radius in kilometers. The mass, again, similarly we're measuring effectively masses relative to the star. Now we're getting a mass in actual kilograms. But the reason I mention the age is, you know, if you talk to individuals who study the solar system, you know, planets are, are, like stars, are very interesting. They, they, they're, they're, they're not fixed quantities throughout their lives. The Earth is a very different thing than it was two billion years ago and was a very different thing 100 million years after its birth and will be a very different thing in terms of its atmospheric content in another few billion years. So knowing with precision the ages of stars and therefore their planetary systems is going to be extremely exciting as we move ahead and actually study the atmospheres of these planets. If you're just fitting stars to kind of their position, their, their luminosity and temperature, that, it doesn't give you the age of the star very well. But with astro seismology, you can usually get it to about 10%. Okay, so uh, this is the Kepler-36 system. We were able to measure the masses of these two guys. Um, and, uh, and lo and behold, they have very different compositions, even though they have very similar uh, insulations. Okay, so, so great. So for Kepler-36, we get precise constraints on the masses and radii. Uh, let's, let's put Kepler-36 down on the plot. Okay, there's Kepler-36, okay? So that's Kepler-36b. Kepler-36c, the fluffier guy, is off the plot. So fluffy, I'm not interested in it. Kepler-36 is, 36b, is the only TTV planet that's gonna make it onto this diagram. And, and looking ahead to the future, I'm not gonna get other ones from future missions as well. So the, the, the point is to, you know, this was a very rare system where we got very precise constraints on the mass from these timing variations. But upcoming missions, so that the way the Kepler mission is operating now, upcoming missions that I'll talk about at the end of my talk, don't really have enough baseline to give us so many transits that we actually are going to get comparable data sets. So, uh, so it, it isn't going to be a reasonable path forward to hope that timing variations are going to give us a whole bunch of precise masses and really tell us 
uh, the compositions of planets in the galaxy. Now, as I fill in this plot, I'm, I'm going to be uh, quite picky about my data. And so to make it onto this plot, I'm going to demand that, that someone has measured the mass of the planet to a precision of at least 20%. And also that I believe the mass measurement, okay? So that I, I actually believe they've accounted for systematic errors. Uh, it's not enough that there's a published paper, okay? They're, I have to really believe that they've accounted for all the, all the possible sources of uncertainty. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna really just pick out the high quality data. And this was really inspired by, a, there was a similar, there was a review paper written by my colleague Willie Torres at the CFA about the mass radius relation for very low mass stars. And you'll see versions of that plot where it just looks like a scatter plot and there's a debate about whether low mass stars were inflated. And, but once you really go through and just pick the data that are really carefully measured, a very clear pattern emerges and it's, it's really the way towards progress. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay. So uh, the, second, the second system that's going to make it on my plot, Corot 7. So Corot was a French-led ESA mission. It was, a, it was a transit survey. It predated Kepler. And it found one and only one small planet. The entire mission found one small planet, uh, which is uh, the seventh such discovery in the Corot mission, the seventh planet with Corot called Corot 7. Corot 7 uh, is a, an awful star if you want to go and precisely determine the mass of the planet. And let me show you why. This is measurements of the brightness of the star as a function of time. So uh, this is 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. And here, this is the brightness of the star wandering. This is a range of 1%, peak to peak. Here, you can just see the star wandering along and changing in brightness. Why is it changing in brightness? Primarily due to spots. You can see that there's spots that are rotating in and out of view, so you can basically see the rotation period. Um, but there's other effects due to, uh, due to convection. Um, and what that means is, you know, when it, so if, if then we, we want to get the masses through the Doppler measurements, right, that's one of the kind of the miracles of really precise mass measurements with Doppler spectroscopy, is that you have this star and the velocity field in the star is enormous, right? The star is rotating. The sun, if you look at the sun, the, the limb of the sun is moving at two kilometers a second. And yet, um, you know, miraculously, it's all going to average to zero so that you can measure wobbles at the level of one meter a second. So if I put down one little measly spot on one hemisphere, one side of the star, then all of a sudden, when I integrate over the visible hemisphere, I get this spurious Doppler shift that has nothing to do with orbital motion. Okay? So that's, that's what's going on here with Corot 7. So then there was this, as you can imagine, this was the only, you can imagine they really put a lot of effort into this system because this was the only small planet they had found. So they gathered an enormous set of radial velocities which show this big, big, big scatter, and that scatter is just due to the, the uh, astrophysical uh, behavior of the star. It has nothing to do with the orbital motion of the planet. Then they said, oh, well, maybe the smart thing to do is we'll simultaneously get radial velocities when we're actually pointing at that star, and then we'll use the photometry to remove all the dominant periods and signals that we see, because anything that's reflected in the photometry is not a planet. It's just due to the, the, the different stellar effects. And then we'll model that on top of an actual sinusoid to account for the planet we do know about. So that was a very nice analysis that was led by Raphael Haywood. Raphael is a graduate student at the University of St. Andrews. And this just came out uh, a few months ago. It was an enormous investment of telescope time to overcome this noisy star. But they did manage to get a, a mass measurement good enough to be on the plot. So let me put Raphael's point for Crow 7 on this plot. There it is. OK. Oh, you can't see them. So, you know, if the sun varies by much more in intensity than the brightness of than the, than the effect of the Earth going in front of the sun, it's just a matter of frequency, right? So the point is, as long the variations here over um, ten days or a few days don't matter if the transit is a few hours. But once these become comparable to the orbital period, you're, you're screwed. That's the trouble. Okay? So, that, so the transit itself is short, and you have no trouble just filtering. Basically, just uh, uh, high pass filter the data. So, okay. Okay. So we put on Crow 7. Great. So maybe we'll get more from Crow 7. No. As I mentioned, Crow 7, this was the only one. So Crow 7 is Crow's not going to give us any more uh, planets. The, the mission is not gathering data. And moreover, the spectrograph we use to make those measurements can't be used to look at the Kepler field. Kepler had given us hundreds of such small planets, but this spectrograph and Corot were looking in the southern hemisphere. We just literally can't see the stars. So that's why we set out on this project that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. 
Okay. So the project is HARPS North. It's a partnership between the Geneva Observatory, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And then as we, as we were moving along and building the spectrograph, of course, we needed a telescope and we ultimately talked to our Italian colleagues. And so it's located uh, on the island of La Palma at the Galileo National Italian Telescope. It's a 3.6 meter telescope. It's a copy of HARPS uh, South. So HARPS has been in operation for 10 years. It was before HARPS North the preeminent machine for measuring uh, subtle radial velocities and therefore really measuring the masses of planets. Mm -hmm. HARPS North is the best working instrument for doing this. Uh, no question. Um, and uh, let me show you some of the results. The way, the way that HARPS North works is uh, it's simply just the, the direct mechanical stability of the spacecraft. So we don't use any gas absorption cells. We have a, sp we, uh, not the spacecraft, the spectrograph. The, 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 the spectrograph is uh, enclosed in a doer and kept at extremely constant temperature and pressure. And then we put the doer in a room, which we also hold at very constant temperature and pressure. And then we put that in another room. And that's at very constant temperature and pressure. And, and nobody, not even the chair, is allowed to go in and look at the instrument, let alone the doer. Okay, you just, you're not allowed to go in and mess with it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's comparable. Um, I think I wrote that. Yeah, so the, the main improvements to Harp South were that we use octagonal fibers, which are better at scrambling the modes, uh, and therefore they get a much better illumination of the spectrograph. Uh, and we use a monolithic CCD. So before we had CCDs kind of stitched together. Um, but uh, the, over, sort of the general throughput and performance is broadly similar, but a little bit better, a little bit better. This, and I won't show them here, but we have, an astro, we have a laser frequency comb. And for example, with the detector in Harps North, we can see that the pixels are not all the same size at the level of a part in a thousand. Like, ah, right? So, because think about it, you're, you're measuring your, these are, oh, you're, you're a theorist, right? You're, you're all at city, you don't have to worry about the, life is easy. Eh? I, it's so messy as an observer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but the point is you have these stellar absorption features that are moving on a pixel grid, and you assume if it moves a certain number of pixels that that's the Doppler shift. But uh, now if it, if it, if it measure, moves some measured amount and the pixels are actually different sizes and you don't know that, then you get these spurious rate of velocities. And don't forget that the spectrum is not, it's not moving by thousands of pixels, it's moving an enormous amount because the Earth is going around the sun. So you get all these one-year aliases and, ah, it's so complicated. So, so there are real improvements over Harps, Harps uh, South. Yeah. So what are the velocities that you think you can believe them? Yeah, well, I'll show you. But, so, so, I mean, in a nutshell, for the Kepler data, as long as we can get a meter a second, we're done because we're photon starved. Okay, so we just can't afford to do better. But there's a whole other, so basically we have 80 guaranteed nights a year, which is the other major asset. Uh, 40 of those go into Kepler follow-up. 40 go into looking at very nearby bright stars. And then with the laser frequency comb there, we're pushing down to tens of centimeters a second. And there it's all about correcting for the stellar variability. We have a, we have a daytime program. They've, they've, it's, they've got a solar feed now where they have daytime hours are used to actually monitor the sun. So that's really a great engineering effort going on. So Ken Lambert used to do that. Yeah, we called the, it was at the 200, and she called it the 200 micron telescope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, a big part of um, undertaking, really using Harps North to measure the masses. So the idea is we're gonna go to Kepler, we're gonna pick out planets uh, that are the best targets for really precise mass measurements. The art is uh, picking out the stars that are quiet stars that are not going to give you trouble and present spurious rate of velocity signals. And so um, before launching into our 2014 observing season, there was a target selection tiger team, which is kind of a dramatic name. But basically these were top graduate students. So it was Courtney Dressing at Harvard. It was Raphael Haywood at University of St. Andrews. Uh, it was Ati Motalebi, who's, a, who's a, a graduate student at Geneva. And they basically uh, worked the problem in terms of how do we pick the very best stars so that we're not wasting our time. So what we did is we picked all stars brighter than 13 and a half magnitude, hosting a planet smaller than three or three radii in a period less than 50 days. If it didn't meet those criteria, you, you were never gonna have enough photons to measure the signal. So that was a pretty broad net. Um, then we favored stars with astroseismic characterization because as I said, everything's measured ultimately relative to the star. So if you, if you can't lock down the star with the requisite precision, there's no point in measuring the rate of velocities with uh, better precision. Um, and then the key was to really conduct a photometric analysis. So what we can leverage in the case of Kepler is we have four years of monitoring. Kepler is no longer getting data when we're setting out to get our radio velocities. But for example, if you, and this is just representative stars that were otherwise good, but are gonna fail to make it into our final list of targets. 
So for example, this you know, Kepler 211, if you measure, if you plot the photometry as a function of time, um, you can see these big, big, big variations, and that's due to uh, the rotation. Those are due to spots on the star, and you can even see the, star, the spot pattern evolve over the course of years. Very, very interesting, but really awful star for precise rate of velocity measurements. Um, there are other stars uh, where uh, basically when we did measure the rotation period for the star, we wanted to make sure the rotation period was very far from being the orbital period or being some multiple of the orbital period so that there was no um, crosstalk. Uh, and then also we had, we had constraints on short time scale variation, which we've learned tells us about the granulation of the star. And, and, um, and those are this kind of the flicker papers by Fabien Bastien. Okay. So um, basically there was a heavy vetting effort to go through thousands of these potential candidates and really find the most profitable stars to get precise uh, mass measurements for the planets. So then we have this list of survivors, and then what we can say is if the mass radius relation is, this is a bit like a design study. We have a mass radius relation that's X, then uh, how many hours is it gonna cost me for this planet and this planet and this planet to measure the mass with a certain precision? Maybe the mass radius relation is Y, so then I do that, and I wanna make sure that I can um, spend my telescope time efficiently. Our goal is 15% mass measurements for planets smaller than two Earth radii. That's, never, that's really hard, okay? That's, 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 uh, that's really pushing down. Uh, 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 for these um, relatively faint stars. And we have our 40 telescope nights to spend. Okay, so let me walk you through. These are, th this one is published. This was uh, uh, one of our first stars, Kepler-78. Kepler-78 is a, is a weird planet, but it's a dream planet for radial velocity observers because it's got an eight hour orbital period. So because it's in such a short orbital period, uh, we get a, for the same mass of the planet, we get a relatively large um, reflex stellar amplitude. And so um, uh, this is the photometry of the star. But again, this, this ringing you're seeing here is just the, uh, uh, it's just the rotation. Uh, but it was, it was significantly different period, so that didn't pose a problem for getting the mass of the sky. What was so interesting about Kepler-78 is the planet is only slightly larger than the Earth. Okay, so it was 1.15 Earth radii. So if we could get the mass of it, that would be really interesting. Uh, and the short orbital period of eight hours. There was an independent determination, not, not quite as precise, but an independent determination by keck Hires. Um, and here's our data, okay? So I'm gonna put that in a plot in a moment. Uh, next system was Kepler-10. Kepler-10 was the first kind of rocky planet. Kepler-10b was the first rocky planet found by uh, the Kepler spacecraft. Um, uh, these are the transits for the two planets in the system. There's one planet, here's its transit with a period of 0.8 days. There's another planet, here's its transit with a period of 45 days. So obviously very clearly detected. And just to show you how impressive the Kepler photometry is, this is one part in 10,000. This is two parts in 10,000. Okay, so they, so very, uh, you know, those are obviously convincing detections of the transits. And you can see we just gathered enormous numbers of radial velocities to really pin down the masses for these two uh, planets. Intriguingly, most of these have astro seismology. This is an example. This is a 10.6 giga year old star. We really know it's 10.6 and not seven or five. And so that's very interesting uh, as well for thinking about these planets. Oh, this one I don't remember. Uh, you know, I avoid the temptation to say, well, it's gotta be metal poor. There's so many surprises. So. Um, okay, and then Kepler 93, this is unpublished. Uh, this, this, there, were, there were really two, I, I'll, I'll say both of them both of these uh, papers. So the reason we were drawn to Kepler-93 was because of the work of Sarah Ballard, who was a graduate student working with me and is now a Sagan fellow at the University of Washington. What Sarah found about Kepler-93 was um, there was just exquisite astroseismic modes in the data, despite the fact that it's a relatively low mass star. So as you go down in stellar mass, it's much harder to see those astroseismic modes. Um, and she did this uh, lovely study showing that she could measure the radius of the planet to an accuracy, an accuracy of 120 kilometers, which is really uh, impressive. So it's 1.48 Earth radii. So then we knew if we could get the mass of this guy, uh, it would be a very important contribution to the mass radius diagram. So um, these are the radial velocities. Keck high res as part of the Kepler follow-up had been looking at it for the first four years because it was the planet that it wasn't characterized, but the Signal was known very early on because it's a relatively bright star. But you can see they hit it with relatively low cadence. They've got a few observations every season. Whereas, you know, we started observing it over two seasons and just observed it basically every night if we could. Out of interest, of course, 
Th this is not the planet signal, right? This, this acceleration is due to some other uh, longer period companion where we haven't seen the curvature yet. Um, out of interest, we've got it boxed in. So here I'm plotting as a function of angular separation and mass. We know there's another thing in that system, and we have constraints based on the fact that uh, it does cause an RV trend. There's no curvature yet, and we don't see it in any high AO uh, images. So we've got this guy boxed in, but so eventually it's going to show itself. Um, but it, it's probably a brown dwarf for a very low mass star. Uh, and that's, that is actually very interesting for understanding this system in particular, but it doesn't impact the mass, which is the thing I want today. So then when I correct for, when, when Courtney corrects for this, uh, we get the mass uh, of the transiting planet very well. And so Courtney submitted that for publication to AppChain. Okay, so uh, yeah, and then to really talk about um, how Harps North is doing compared to, for example, Keck High Res. So here we have, a, a con we have both Harps and High Res data. And so then if I um, take my best fit model and I plot the residuals of the Harps North data, the new instrument, um, this is, these are the residuals. So the half width is about one and a half meters a second for the dark blue curve. If I take the high res residuals, the Keck high res residuals, the half width, there really is no big peak, okay? The half width is more like four meters a second, three and a half meters a second. Um, so this is not, this is really not meant to beat up on high res. I mean, high, Harps North is two generations later, right? High res was a brilliant idea where you took an existing slit spectrograph and realized, oh, if you could put a gas absorption cell, uh, that would allow us to take this existing instrument and get precise rate of losses and start finding some planets. But um, I think now in the era of, you know, these extra 15 years of experience, we know, we know how to really do this problem. It doesn't require a gas absorption cell. What that does is it means we can use the entire spectral range, right? We use the entire optical range to get our radio velocity measurements. When you're using a gas absorption cell, you, only get, you can only do it in the regions where the gas is spectroscopically active. So in the case of iodine, that's only about 100 nanometers. Okay, here we're using 500 nanometers. So that's why, and, and the point is these are the same integration times, and we're on a 3.6 meter, and that's on a 10 meter, and yet we're doing much better. So it's really, it's really um, shows you the role of these kind of mid-range telescopes with these high efficiency, by which I mean large wavelength and high throughput uh, spectrographs. Okay. Um, right. That, uh, for this one, it's basically, the, there, there is a, so when we model, we say, is there a constant jitter term that we don't know about? And is it merited by the data when we do our Bayesian analysis? And in this case, there's not a substantial one. Okay. Um, in some stars, there is. But, but essentially, we think in this particular system, we're getting to the photon noise limit. So, okay. So uh, let's put the plots, the points down. So we've been working this. We, so these are three systems that the analysis is done. The papers are submitted so I can share them with you. There are additional ones coming that I can't share today. Um, so there's uh, Kepler 78. Okay, so remember that was the eight hour period one, but just a little bit bigger than the Earth. Uh, Kepler 10b and Kepler 93b. Okay, so, so I'm proud of this, right? This is, it looks like there's a pattern here. There's not a lot of things here. It's not a lot of things here. Um, uh, and so um, the question you might naturally ask is, oh, gosh, if, if I take uh, my model for the Earth, a simple model for the Earth, and simply scale up or down the mass of the Earth and draw that line, does it explain the data? Uh, and it does. It does explain the data. So if I, so I, I take this a very simplistic model of the Earth. So it's a two-component model. I assume the core of the Earth is a pure iron ball, and I assume it has a mantle, which is pure magnesium silicate. So that's the sort of statement that like a, any self-respecting solar system scientist would get up and leave the room, that that's such a naive view of, but you know, as, as astrophysicists, we, we cherish that, that kind of simplicity in our models. But, but the, the, the point is I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to make statements about the actual abundance ratio of iron to magnesium silicate. I'm saying, Whatever it is, if I take the same model and simply tweak the mass, I, I, I find all these planets. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven with the solar system planets, and they're all well explained by this one fam, with this one curve. Okay, so, and then out of interest, there was this nice paper by Grasset et al., where they said, well, if you look around at nearby stars, in those cases they were they were exoplanet host stars, but not these exoplanet hosts, and you said, what is the what is the range in relative abundances 
of uh, magnesium to silicate to iron in the photospheres and presumably the bulk of those stars and said, and if I look at that variation, how much variation would I expect in the radii of, how much impact would that have on the radii of planets? Just the intrinsic scatter of magnesium iron silicate. That's the width of this blue line. So, so a very interesting kind of picture is emerging. Now, I don't want to oversell this. It's very few data points, uh, but there are many, there are more coming. Um, but uh, it is intriguing to me that they do seem to all um, know about this uh, one uh, simple relationship. These are all inside of 80 days? These are, these are all hot. So, yeah, right. They're, whew, yeah, they're, uh, God. Um, yeah, so these, these are all uh, relatively short orbital periods. That's the longest one, right? This is four days, that's like a day. Kepler 36 was 14 day, 13 days, something. Okay. So then, of course, we can say, oh, well, well, does that relation continue? What if I find and characterize with, with, uh, with my precise spectrographs more massive planets? So let's put those guys on. Okay. So here are the more massive planets. Okay. So this is Kepler 10c. Remember, there's the two planet system. Uh, that's Kepler 10c. Um, this is a guy you don't know about yet. Uh, this is 1214, which we found with, it was an M dwarf transit survey. So there's, there's a whole, and, and there's a whole bunch up this way, right? Neptune, you could put Neptune on here, but Neptune will be up there. There's nothing here. So that's very interesting to me that, that so far we have not found any planets more massive than about six Earth masses, which nonetheless have a rocky composition consistent with the Earth. Okay, They're, they would be very easy for us to measure. It'd be very, if there's a planet in here uh, that was, you know, 1.92 Earth radii, we have some of those in our sample, we would have, it's easier, right, the more massive planet, at fixed radius, it's easier if the mass is higher. We would have seen that. So, um, again, relatively small number of planets, but this is the current uh, pattern that we're seeing. So, uh, no planets in this region, I think, is one of the real standout parts of the diagram. Okay. Um, so, uh, what are the prospects for kind of pushing uh, ahead on this? Um, so, uh, right now, um, there's a lot of excitement uh, and there's a lot of data coming from the K2 mission. So, K2 is the continuation of the Kepler mission after the failure of the second reaction wheel. Basically, the, um, the plan is if we point the Kepler spacecraft in the ecliptic, then for periods of up to three months, it can maintain a fixed pointing and balance the radiation pressure on the spacecraft. So effectively what the spacecraft does is pointing um, uh, uh, with, the, with the sun at right angles, it's pointing off in this direction, the ecliptic plane. It's, it's not very stable, so there's a roll of the spacecraft, and then every so often we fire the thrusters and bring it back. So as a result, in the focal plane, the stars are executing arcs on our detector array, but instead of being held fixed on some pixel, they're now wandering over dozens of pixels. And we don't know the sensitivity of those pixels at the level we need to. But if the star executes the same arc back and forth over many months, then you can use the data to correct itself. Okay, so as long as that time scale of wander is very different than the actual transit time scale, uh, then the idea is Kepler should sh still be able to find transiting planets. It can't find um, long period transiting planets because it can only look for at most three months. Uh, but it can find short period planets. So for for the, the heart of the Kepler, if you think the heart of the Kepler mission was to find Earth's at Earth temperature, K2 is not going to help you. Uh, K2 is not going to help with statistics, but what it will do is find brighter stars with short period, small transient planets. So for us, for the, for the measuring the masses, it's great. Because now we're looking at 10 times more sky. Because there's going to be about 10 of these fields. Okay. Um, so uh, we have um, discovered and characterized the first planet with the K2 mission. This is not public yet. Um, but it is uh, a wonderful work done by Andrew Vandenberg, uh, Ben Montet, and John Johnson, who I hear is, I'm gonna, he's, my, he's got the office next to me at Harvard, but I hear he's here on Wednesday. So John can tell you all about it. Um, this is really, you know, this is a second year grad student, just wrote his own analysis pipeline for K2, published the pipeline, published all the stars, except one star, did you notice? And, and this is the star. So here, these are the roles you can see of the spacecraft. You can see this is kind of a, this is the brightness, but this is effectively the star wandering. And uh, what he does is he corrects the data. This was the engineering data, so this was not three months of data. He only had six days of good data and several thousand stars. He did this, and he found one star that showed a single transit. Okay? 
And it's a, it's a named star. It's a Hipparchus, well, not named, but it's got a Hipparchus number. Okay, so it's a bright star, catalog star. And so what we did is we said, oh, well, we don't know the period, but we can work out what the probability is that the period is less than something where you couldn't detect it with the Harps North. And we said, well, that's pretty small. So we'll go after it with Harps North. So with Harps North, the benefit is we have 40 nights a summer in our back pocket, so we can just start getting data the next day. Here's our rate of velocity measurements. So we're clearly able to measure the period and the mass of that planet, and we then can calculate that the, that the transit lines up. Um, the, the third instrument that played an important role is the most spacecraft. So after we got the single transit and we started to calculate the rate, of, I think actually even before the rate of velocity, most decided to just stare at it for about three weeks and weekly recovered um, some transits. Uh, so anyway, so uh, it's Hipparchus 116454. We're able to get the mass and uh, put it on the diagram, and that's this guy. He was already up there, but, but you know, and, and, and I think we could work to really shrink down the uncertainty on the radius and the mass. Um, so, so the key part about all these planets is that they, we don't know, you know, in terms of interpreting them, they could be a ball of rock and iron with a little bit of hydrogen, or they could be a mixture of iron and magnesium silicates and uh, volatiles like water in the form of ice. We have no, we, we just know the density is low, but we can't differentiate between those ideas. We can with follow-up observations. There's a, where we can study the atmosphere when the planet passes in front of the star. That would definitely nail it. That would tell us the scale height and therefore the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. <clears throat> I know, I talked to Matt, Matt Mountain who's the director of the Space Telescope and he said, 60 HST orbits for a flat line. Anyway, what, what he's referring to is that um, some of the planet, of course, if the planet has clouds, you don't get to probe the atmosphere. And this planet is attractive because it's the lowest mass planet where you can really go and actually get at the atmosphere. These, we can't really study the atmosphere. And yet, it doesn't seem to have any, even if the atmosphere is pure water, okay, so no hydrogen, we would be able to measure that. And you, and you don't see any features, so we think it's got to be clouds. Okay, so, you know, to think about this, I mean, you know, here's the sort of questions now that, that I'm thinking about. Kind of a simplistic view of this is great. This is, this is what I learned about planet formation as an undergraduate. Uh, these planets formed inside the snow line. They're made of iron and rock. Uh, these planets formed outside the snow line. They've got some ice. That's why they're more massive. There was more material around. Uh, they migrated in, okay? But an alternate, an alternate view is that all of these planets formed inside the snow line. But because these are more massive, just because these came from perhaps slightly more massive protoplanetary disks, so there was a little bit of a conspiracy in terms of the late, you know, joining together of kind of the, the, um, the isolation masses that were left over in that, in that disk. Uh, these, these are created and retain some hydrogen. Okay, so that's what we were talking about today. And that's, 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 the, um, that's the question. A third, I think, uh, a third view that I was disabused of in conversations earlier today was could, could it be that these actually all form beyond the snow line, and then you move them in close to the star, and because these are very close to the star, you, you just simply get rid of all the ice that was mixed in with the rock. And that, I think, is just not feasible, right? So the idea is, um, you, here you're talking about, you know, you start with a 10 Earth mass body, and you've got to get rid of five Earth masses of volatiles, and left, be left with a five Earth mass rocky thing. That, that's just not gonna work, so. Anyway, so um, this is not the end of the story. We're gonna, we really wanna get more of these planets, now, as a function of insulations, to really find examples of these that are cooler and really tell us, make sure we're not seeing, we, 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 we don't know whether this reflects evolution or whether this reflects evolution. If we find versions of these planets farther from the stars but actually are bright enough we can measure their masses, then that would really uh, um, uh, help us. Um, and, uh, and then, as I said, doing atmospheric studies on some of these will help resolve whether they're really uh, hydrogen dominated or not. Okay. Um, great. Oh, okay. So, so then, the, then the looking ahead, uh, the, um, the NASA test mission is the big, the big, uh, well, the little guy of great weight on the horizon. Um, TESS is, the idea behind TESS is TESS will take the results from the Kepler mission and then find the trouble, if there was one failure with the Kepler mission, is that the stars were all far away and faint. So they were just difficult to do follow-up. What we want is the Kepler population of stars, but around the, uh, the Kepler population of planets, but around the very closest stars. So what TESS will do is survey the entire sky 
and find the, the same population, we hope, but around stars that are, you know, um, sixth magnitude instead of being 12th magnitude or 14th magnitude. TESS is uh, simply four camera lenses. It's a much more humble mission. It's an explorer class mission, not a discovery class mission, which is what Kepler was. Uh, just to show you what this looks like, these are uh, 10 centimeter, these are not that different from kind of camera, uh, uh, kind of high, high speed uh, telephoto lens. Um, it's got a band, you know, red optical band pass. Um, and uh, like Kepler, we can't return all the data all the time, so we have to pick the stars. So we pick about 500,000 stars, return the data with two minute cadence. But interestingly, TESS has a new mode where it returns all the data, the full frame images, uh, every 30 minutes. Um, this is a prototype of a lens, an actual working lens, uh, when we went down to NASA HQ to give our final pitch to convince them that this was the right next choice for the Explorer program, and we were successful. And this is how TESS uh, will monitor the sky. So TESS takes its four camera lenses and in a single shot images from the ecliptic, almost the ecliptic up to the pole, the ecliptic pole, okay? And then it's in a lunar resonance orbit, so it's in a 14-day orbit. And so it does that for two orbits. It's in very elliptical orbit, so it comes in swooping to the Earth. That's great for downlink. Then it goes away from the Earth, so there's no scattered light. It takes nice, nice, good data. And it does that twice. So for regions that are um, at low ecliptic latitude, we get 28 days of data. But as you go up in ecliptic latitude, then you get more coverage. And so if we look at, this, at the sphere, the celestial sphere, um, uh, as we move up towards the ecliptic pole, we get longer baselines, because at the pole, that one field is simply pivoting throughout the year. Um, so at near the ecliptic pole, uh, we will study that region for nearly one year continuously. So we'll be able to find much longer period planets. Completely intentionally and by design, that is the continuous viewing zone of the James Webb Space Telescope. So the whole idea behind TESS is not so much to do statistics, so it's really hard to improve on Kepler statistics, it's to find the most profitable transiting planets for the world to study. The data go public immediately, Okay, there's no proprietary period, despite the fact that these scientists are going to spend years of their life working on these data and getting the spacecraft ready and so on. Um, and uh, what do we think TESS will find? This is simulations done by graduate student Peter Sullivan at MIT. We think TESS will find about 30 Earths and about 200 to 240 super-Earths, as well as a whole bunch of larger planets. But these are really the planets that TESS was built uh, to find. So these will be the best, the closest transiting planets. Um, and uh, this is life without TESS. So this is planet radius and orbital period. Um, if we don't fly TESS, then we're mostly left with hot Jupiters around bright stars. If we do find tests, fly TESS, then we get this really rich population of planets around bright stars uh, at very interesting radii, one to two, three uh, Earth radii. Okay, so just to uh, summarize, okay? So uh, three, three takeaway points. First, small planets are common. So at least 16% of sun-like stars have an Earth-sized planet. The mean number of habitable planets per M dwarf, the only kind of star we can really measure that number, is 0.35. When we restrict the planets with precise masses and radii, so far, all planets between one and six Earth masses are consistent with an Earth-like composition, iron and rock. There are no such planets more massive than six Earth masses. Those planets must have significant amounts of volatiles or hydrogen helium, but all with the caveat that it's a relatively small number of objects, surely surprises await us. The NASA test mission will discover about 300 Earths and super Earths that transit nearby stars. Perhaps five of these will be habitable planets in the continuous viewing zone of the James Webb Space Telescope. That's my last slide. Thanks. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a great question. It's, it's not an RV survey, right? It's a transit survey. And then we took, we took the most profitable ones, but we didn't know which ones would be rocky. We simply took the ones where the stars were quiet. So provided there's no relationship between stellar noisiness and the mass of the planet, then, then we, we went and said we've got to get 20% mass measurements. 
Yes, by construction, I would say, because I'm demanding a relative, fixed relative precision, then I'm making it really hard, if there are Earth-sized planets that are fluffy out there, I'm making it hard for them to cross the finish line. Um, so, so the way to really answer that is to take all, so we do have data on other stars where we just only have a few measurements. But I think the first question would be to take all the data we have and ask, are any of those uh, inconsistent with the rocky composition? So is there any evidence of this other population? The answer, I believe, is no, but this is something we'll follow up. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at all the Harps North data that we gathered. There are claims, there are a couple systems where there are Earth-sized planets that are claimed to be quite fluffy. They're both from transit timing variations, intriguingly. Uh, and, um, but they all have large error bars, and so they're only inconsistent with a rocky composition at the level of a couple sigma. So it's, it's not much tension to worry about. And you can't follow those up? No. So for example, the, 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 the archetypal fluffy multi-planet system is Kepler-11. Uh, which, and Jack Lissauer's led a series of papers on those, and um, it's just too faint. It'd be wonderful if it's just too faint. For a 20 meter telescope? I'm sure, with the, with the GMT uh, we could, except it's in the southern hemisphere. The, the TMT could, I, I think, um, I mean, we, I, we talked about this today. I, I, I think that um, before we go and get a lot of radio velocity measurements, I think the question to ask is, uh, if I make those planets more massive, uh, what, what's really broke? This is really, I, I was talking to Josh Wynn about that. He said, look, just make them massive and what, what's really broken? What, 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 what goes wrong with the TTV measurements? And if you can find a plausible, so the point is, is the TTV characterization study really, really mapping out the whole search space? Or are they actually just missing perfectly plausible situations in which they're more massive? In which case, they don't really have any weight on this, on this question. So I think before, well, we have time, because the TMT is going to be a couple more years, I think. We, we, should, we should just do some more TTV work. Yeah, ultimately, sure, that would be the way. So the first first light instrument on the GMT, for example, is GCLEF, is a radial velocity instrument. So you can't look at this particular star, but it would really be the way to go and just knock these out of the park, no question. Yeah. Yeah, from the data that you've got uh, in general, can you do something about the range of variation of the ecliptic angle for these systems? So you mean the, um, the, the inclinations of the? Yeah, how flat is the Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, that's a whole talk. Yeah, yeah I thought, yeah. Um, yes, so there are, um, there, there are a number, a subset of systems that are remarkably flat. So for example, that Kepler 36. So the point is, you, you, when you have a multi-planet transiting system, um, uh, if there's an interaction where they're, where they're changing their mutual inclinations, the way you see that is the duration of the transit, not the time of transit, but the duration changes, because now it's changing the chord across the star. Yeah. And in Kepler-36, we can see that they're exquisitely flat and not varying. Um, then I would say, uh, yes, what you, can, what you can do, so for example, there was a really nice paper by Sarah Ballard and John Johnson um, uh, a, couple, a few weeks ago, and what they said was, you know, look at the number of single transiting planet systems, two planet transiting systems, three transiting planet systems, four trans for M dwarfs. Is it consistent that they're all planetary systems have four planets? And then if so, what's the constraint on the inclinations? And they actually find that no, that there's, there looks like there's multi-planet systems that are relatively well const tightly constrained and then there must be these kind of singletons. So there, there you know, there's a whole, there, there's honestly on that question, there's probably about 25 papers that have been written. So, and it does look like there's a number of systems that are extremely coplanar, but then there's also some, some singleton systems. There's a claim not to as narrow of a, of a well, you know, the stellar spin isn't lined up with the angle of the planets in one of these low mass planet systems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, so the other constraint is in many systems we can measure the stellar rotation axis projected on the sky and uh, relative to the, to the planetary orbital axis. And, and, and so for the close and massive planets, we see many systems which are actually um, very misaligned to the point of some of actually being uh, counter-rotating. So, but for, the, but for the low mass, I think it'd be very interesting for the multi-planet low mass systems, I would really be shocked if those were not aligned. And you're saying it is aligned. Oh, that's true. 
Yeah, so that's right. So seismology actually, if you're into the, so so the what's called the Rosser McLaughlin effect gives you the, the inclination in the sky. But actually, seismology, as you tip, you you see different. Um, you actually can measure the uh, the projected angles. So you can actually get the true angle if you have both of them. Maybe that comes from M dwarfs, where they're actually seeing spot crossings. That would be the other way to do it. So. Just if you're interested in coming for dinner, just come to me and uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.